Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming to the presentation tonight. This is a presentation of the findings of the online and paper surveys um, that we have conducted over the last couple of months. In addition to that, I'll be speaking about some of the field work that I have conducted in the parks and open spaces. My name is Rochelle McKnight. I am a landscape architect and arborist with Weston and Sampson. And this is Tom. Hello, Tom Deal with Green Play. I am a project consultant or project manager and a former operator of parks and recreation facilities for 35 plus years. Great. So, to introduce Weston and Sampson, we're the primary firm that has been conducting the master plan with great assistance from Greenplay, Tom's firm. Weston and Sampson is a full-scale, uh, multidisciplinary planning, engineering, landscape architecture firm. So we have a wide range of knowledge and backgrounds from which to pull during this planning process. Um, we have been back and forth to Simsbury quite a bit. Um, we have been back and forth to Simsbury quite a bit over the summer and in the spring. Um, I especially have come back and forth to Simsbury and have conducted a lot of field work. I've gotten to know quite a bit, of, quite a lot of you very well. I'm starting to feel like this is my second home, and I feel very welcome here each time I come. So I really appreciate that. Um, again, we are going to be presenting the results of some of the stakeholder engagement that we've done. Um, we've gone through public input sessions. We actually presented the finer details of some of that stakeholder input at the last session. So today's session, we're going to be wrapping some of that information in, but we'll specifically focus on the online survey that was posted over the last couple of months. Um, Tom specifically is going to speak to the demographics of the region and trends that his company, which specializes in this type of thing, has been seeing across the country and in the local area. Um, and then I'll speak to some of the field work that I have done, but really what we want to do is make some time at the end so that you all have a chance to give us some feedback about what you thought of the survey um, and what you think of the results that you've seen coming in. Um, so that's really, we want to definitely have as much engagement as we can. Just to be prepared, this is a fairly lengthy presentation. It's definitely one of the longer presentations that we do. So I, if you can stay for the whole thing, we would absolutely love that. And we would really hope that you are interested in this and we will do our very best to keep you engaged. So I've gone over this. Um, just in terms of a timeline, we are at public meeting number two. Um, we have a couple more stages to go. They're definitely some of our most important stages, although really listening to the community is the very most important thing that we do. Sometimes when we go into a master planning process, um, the client thinks that we, our role is to come in and tell the community what to do, and that is really not the way that things work. In fact, we wait until we have fully digested all of the community input that we receive and all of the different various forms and fashion that we get it in order to develop recommendations. Because it doesn't do us any good as planners to recommend things to you that aren't gonna work for your community. And every town is different. Every town has its own unique set of challenges and opportunities. So just to make that very clear, this is a highly um, engaged and back and forth process from the very beginning until the end. Um, you can look forward to, we will be presenting our draft recommendations sometime in December, probably the earlier part of the December before Christmas, unless you guys wanna come here and eat more cookies for Christmas. Um, and we'll do our final presentation in January. I'm gonna hand it over to Tom now and he's gonna speak to you about demographics. Thank you. So our company, uh, we do a demographic study and a trend study, and we're just gonna go through the highlights. Um, all the information will be provided in the final report. Uh, typically the demographics and trend study is highlighted in the report, and then there's a couple of appendixes that goes through all of that. The reason we do the demographic study is we wanna make sure we truly have a handle on the town of Simsbury 
and we want to make sure that the demographics of our study match up with the demographics of our public engagement and the demographics of our survey. So we've checked all of that. This is again just a, a screen that kind of highlights everything. We took a look at what we thought the population was at the time this study was done, uh, about people's education, income, uh, types of employment, household size, all of those type of things. And again, we double check that against the survey results. Page down. Okay. Thanks. So as far as the population statistics, at the time that we pulled the information, we had 24,647 people living in the town of Simsbury. It's projected that in the next five years, the population is going to grow to about 25,278. And then from there, it will grow in the next five years after that, five, six years to 26,000, and another five years to almost 26,7. This information comes from a firm called Esri. That's who we use to do our demographic studies. They look at things the same way the US Census does as far as all the different population uh, statistics. You can see that during this time, uh, the USA is anticipated at the bottom in the green arrows to increase by about 0.8%. Connecticut, about 0.18%. Uh, Hartford County, 0.14%. The town of Simsbury is going to increase a little faster than those. That's what the statistics tell us. Typically, from 2019 to 2024 is something you can come pretty close to counting on. When you go out another five years and another five years, those are projections that a lot of things can change. Here we're just showing that um, the age distribution. As you can see, the first arrow to the left shows that you one of your higher percentage of people that live here are either in the age of 10 to 14 or 15 to 19. And the second arrow shows that the greatest age group that you have in the town is in the 55 to 59. There's also quite a few people that are 50 to 54, 60 to 45. So those are the two different age groups. This is similar to what we saw in public engagement, and it's similar to what we saw in the survey. And you can see that the population of the town of Simsbury is a little bit heavier, more females than males. And you'll see when you see the survey results, the same thing, more females than males took the survey. And uh, down at the bottom is what would be the median age so in 2019, it was about 46.3. By 2024, it's going to increase slightly to 47.7. That's what the statistics tell us. This slide is just showing that we looked at the household data. The bottom left is the household income in Simsbury. Again, we wanted to make sure what we pulled in the demographics was similar to what we learned in the survey. So when everyone responded in the survey, that's very close to the same number. Uh, the median home value, the size of the households was 2.62 in the towns at Simsbury, very similar to what we got on the survey. Um, we do pull a report and it talks about how many people in the area might uh, need some form of assistance. It was very low, lower than the county, and approximately 16.4% uh, had some type of disability. And that is uh, slightly lower than the national average. But a lot of times we see that number in the 6 7% range. So it just tells us that there are some people in the community that do have some disabilities that need to be considered. So here we looked at employment. We were looking at uh, what the average income was, what type of jobs people had what percent of people commute versus uh, drive alone to work. You can see you have quite a few people here that drive to work. It's not a, a huge commuter area, according to the statistics. Um, a lot of people are educated. Um, there's a median age. There's approximately 9,296 households at the time we took this. And the majority of people are, are employed. And again, we're just checking these. Uh, demographics against the survey. 
This is another thing that we do. We take a look at uh, recreation trends and, and demographics and how much money people are spending in, on recreation. This will be given to the town to be put up on the website so you could look at it closer. It's just showing that we looked at the first column is on average how much uh, a family spends and then to the right would be the total of families in the area. Again, just a lot of information that we're just trying to confirm matches up with the survey. Here this is showing that uh, in the town of Simsbury, the trends are one of the greatest or most important activity for fitness is walking. So quite a few people in this area walk for exercise. That was the number one thing. The second thing that was indicated was swimming, weightlifting, and yoga. And then we look at team sports. The number one activity according to our research, people participate in basketball the most followed by tennis and then soccer. And you can see baseball and volleyball are very close. As far as overall general fitness trends, again, this screen is an awful lot to look at. There is uh, Generation Z, Millennials, Generation X, and Boomers. <coughs> the ages of each category is listed, so those are the colors. The takeaway from the slide is that Outdoor sports and fitness sports are some of the bigger trends in the area. So people that live here like to do a lot of things outdoors, hiking, walking, riding bikes, and they like to do fitness activities. I think during our public engagement, we heard about pickleball a little bit. This is just some statistics showing that pickleball is one of the faster growing activities in sports. You can see the graph. It's just showing how it's continuing to grow. As of 2017, there were 2.8 million pickleball players in the United States, which was an increase of 12% from the year before. And that just seems to be continuing. I think we also talked to people during our public engagement about splash pads or spray pads, outdoor water features, and as you can see, they're continuing to increase each year. They're becoming more and more popular. Then we looked at overall different sport trends. And these are trends, again, related to uh, Simsbury. Some of the things people like to do the most or that have increased recently, things like uh, stand-up pedal, uh, kayaking have increased. Um, some of the teams that are new sports might be rugby, baseball, swimming on a team. You can see over here that almost every type of aerobic activity and every type of individual sport and racket sports have all increased. So people are looking to do more and more on their own. Golf is not one of the things. This is a report that comes from the Sports, Fitness, and Leisure Activities top line. That's one of their studies. I can tell you a little bit about golf. Golf has, we took, golf took a decline around 2000 and between 2002, 2000 and 2004, it took a decline. It made a comeback. Now it's leveling off. Some parts of the country it's declining again. Some parts of the country it's growing again. We're actually working on a project in Yarmouth Port, Massachusetts. Uh, they have a golf course there, and we're taking a look at some. Well, we have a golf course here. Right. right. But this company, when they, this group that does, goes out and does the study, asks people to tell them your top team sport, your top individual sport, your top water sport. And the way people responded, golf was not one of those top things. Just to be clear as well, the golf course was not part of the scope of this master plan specifically. So we can talk about overall trends in golf, but the golf course was not part of the, yeah. the scope of the study. The golf course generates more money than any other... Understood. Yes, I understand. And I, we can discuss this further. We can discuss this further, but we need to get through the presentation now. And we have a whole slide that says questions and answers at the end, so please, if you don't mind, just hold the comments until the end so we can get through these demographics. Thank you. 
Okay, so that's, that concludes the demographic part. We're now going to talk about the actual study. Here I am again. <laughs> so we had a very large volume of responses to the online survey. We typically don't see this many responses, so kudos to you guys. Um, in fact, there were so many responses that SurveyMonkey had a really hard time extracting the data. We had some technical difficulties because of that. But that's a really good reason to have technical difficulties. We were happy about that. Um, one thing that was interesting is that only about half of the surveys were actually completed until the end. And perhaps at the end of our presentation, we can discuss that a little further and try to understand why it is that people started the survey but didn't finish it. Um, and 92% of the respondents were, in fact, residents of Simsbury. Um, survey demographics, I'm just going to kind of breeze through this. But overall, 94% of people own a home in Simsbury. That is really pretty unique um, for a lot of the towns that we work in. So, and by and large, people have lived here either for quite a long time or sort of in the mid-range. There are less people that are here that have only been here a little while. 68% um, of the respondents to the survey were female. That's a pretty large number too, but not uh, unusual for survey respondents. Survey household composition. Uh, the largest number, of course, is adults. Kids are not living on their own in homes, typically. So it's adults and children, 0 to 12 years old, of course, with some teenagers mixed in there. And quite a few people do have dogs. So this is sort of an extraction of all of the charts that you guys saw when you took the survey. The most frequently visited parks were not really surprising at all. They're some of your most beautiful and most um, well-maintained and provide the most facilities and services. So that's Simsbury Meadows, Simsbury Farms, uh, Curtis Park, which is a large soccer facility that also has some passive recreational opportunities. The Flower Bridge, I've been to the Flower Bridge a couple of times now. People love it. It's a great event space, and it's undergoing some great renovations. So I think in the spring, it'll be even more popular. Uh, Memorial Park, which offers a great deal of uh, active recreational opportunities. And Town Forest, which is adjacent to Ethel Walker Woods. There's a pond there. There's some basketball courts, and people seem to really love it for good reason. Um, in terms of least visited, West Mountain Park is a little sort of tucked away playground area, neighborhood park. Tariffville Park is a little hard to find. Uh, the signage could certainly be improved. Um, Meadow Pond is a beautiful, beautiful space, but there aren't a lot of facilities there at the moment, and the ones that are there have seen better days, so perhaps that's why people aren't visiting it. Onion Mountain, I thought, was very interesting. Um, I didn't expect that to see that, but perhaps people just don't know it's there. They don't know how to get there. Um, and then Schultz Park, which is right here in town. It's another one of those hidden gems. So in terms of the quality of town parks and open spaces, it's a little misleading, this chart, because it says no label. But the highest percentage of respondents said that it was between satisfactory and outstanding. So doing pretty darn good, right? So 3.7% average rating in terms of quality, perception of quality of town parks and open spaces. Satisfaction with town parks and open spaces. So people felt, by and large, again, that they were pretty satisfied with what you have here, not feeling like you're really lacking. Um, but it's not like super outstanding, but it's really, really pretty good. Um, another thing that I found was pretty interesting is the barriers to using the town parks and open spaces. The highest volume of respondents said that they didn't find them to be very interesting, um, so they weren't motivated to go to the parks or open spaces. Um, I do this 
as a, as a living, of course, and I see a lot of communities and a lot of parks programs, and I felt like Simsbury quite, had quite a lot to offer, so I found that quite unusual. Um, but then the next um, most frequently answered question was that the parks were not properly maintained, and that's why people felt that they didn't want to go to the parks. I had to present on Saturday for three hours straight, so my voice, if I have to hand off to Tom, I'll let you guys know because my voice might give out a little sooner than I would expect. Um, so, survey facilities or activities pursued. This is very closely in line. In fact, a lot of the survey results were very closely aligned with the overall demographics of the area, which is a good sign because that means that re the respondents were varied enough that we're starting to see trends from a larger picture. So, passive recreation, so that would be your walking or picnicking or bird viewing, um, just, you know, enjoying the outdoors was the most highly valued, um, and it was the thing that people did most often. That then was followed by biking, um, the use of playgrounds. You have a couple of really outstanding playgrounds. Aquatic activities, of course, you've got Simsbury Farms, um, which has an amazing pool, so that was great. I just want to mention one thing. The graph to the right is just a small picture of the whole thing. It takes up four or five slides, so we've gone and put the bullet points to the left of the top thing. So we're trying to show you a graphic representation on the right of what comes out of SurveyMonkey that you can put in a PowerPoint, but it, it, we asked so many different categories, it's like four slides. So what we've done is put here on each, anytime you see bullet points to the left, to the right is just a graphic picture. So just you know, like we're talking about playgrounds, it's not on that list because it was either above or below, but it had a longer bar out to the right. Yeah. That's really a great point. Do you have baseball and basketball? Most people under 25 play those sports. Mm -hmm. Now, is that indicated there at all, the age group? We did not sort the respondents according to the type of activity they pursued by their age range. We did not sort it like that. <coughs> but I can see your concert entertainment. I can see that. Yes. Yes, it does represent the whole town. Yes, so represent the whole town. Right. But I so. Think the others represent a true so, but what Tom was trying to explain is the charts off to the side. When we first composed this PowerPoint, it was like over 60 slides because you have so many parks and you have so many different activities offered at your parks, which is awesome. But in terms of getting it into a presentation that you all don't just fall asleep and hate us by the end of it, we had to take snapshots of those charts. This chart is literally, as he was saying, probably seven pages long with all the different various activities. So just think of it as like a filler picture right, to help you understand what it was kind of looking like when we had the survey processed. Does that make sense to everybody? Does everybody understand that? Thank you, Tom, for pointing that out. That's really important. Are you ultimately saying that the, on the left is really the top ones? Yes, those are what, those are the top ones. So, yes, so on the left here, out of all the percentages, this is how it ranked. These are the top, and then everything else kind of filtered out below. When we do the actual uh, report for you all, we'll be able to break all of that information out in appendices so that you all can really digest it. It's just not possible to discuss every single topic at this presentation in under three hours. Does that make, is that okay with everybody? Everybody gets yes. it? Okay, okay, great. All right, so, um, so moving down the list, hiking was very popular, concerts, and of course, walking and jogging, which it all falls into passive recreation, but I think it was also listed as a subcategory. That's why it appears here, okay? All right, so um, by and large, people liked to say that um, Everything is fine at the parks. 
survey um, what is most important to improve at your parks or to add. People were pretty darn happy with the parks. Again, the little graphic off to the side, that's just Curtis Park, so that's just one of your many, many parks. Um, the other thing people are very interested in improving is bathroom facilities, which makes a lot of sense. Um, you do have some great portalettes, but people would like to see some real bathrooms at the parks. Not surprising. It's not illegal. You get a ticket. We did. We did. Yeah. It was not in the top. Not not in the top tier. But it did. It did show up. It did absolutely show up. Um, what was more more prevalent is that people would like more spaces um, to sit down at and to be able to sit and have a picnic, right? So tables and benches. Uh, would you like to take over sure. for a little bit? Drink my peppermint tea. Mm -hmm. So then we also asked about trail usage and uh, you know how often people were using the trails. There's a key at the bottom. Um, I'm not sure we didn't pull this out quite the same way. on a monthly basis, that's the highest uh, frequency at which people are using the trails. And then it's followed by weekly and then quarterly. Yep. So the majority of people that participated in the survey would use the trails uh, on a monthly basis. But there was a good number of people, as Rochelle just said, that are using it quarterly and weekly. We asked about survey satisfaction for the trails. Scored a 3.3 on a five scale. So again, five is perfect, one is not good at all, three is in the middle, 3.3 is better, but you, there is some room for improvement. We asked about priorities for trails. And again, this is just a graphic representation. There's many pages of all of this. We went through and looked at all of that. The three top things that stuck out to us was the desire to connect the trails to neighborhoods and other resources, uh, more nature trails, and to have as many trails along water, bodies of water as possible. Here we asked about barriers to trail usage, and there weren't quite as many barriers listed. You can see that trails, connectivity, there was poor connectivity, signage issues were some of the top things. Other issues were trail condition, insufficient parking, sometimes they're too crowded. We talked about uh, what type of future recreation programs and activities people would like to have. And again, that's just a representation. You can see it somewhat, it's alphabetical order, so there were many before and after. We pulled out the top responses. People would like to see more activities for soccer, more cultural activities, more baseball, I think someone asked about that, more lacrosse and more swimming opportunities. We asked about open space priorities, same thing, just a picture of the graph. The top responses, people wanted to make sure that natural areas were preserved, uh, develop and improve the existing open space areas, pay attention to water-based recreation, passive recreation opportunities, and then take a look at indoor recreation so that it, everything doesn't have to be out in a park in a space. Maybe there should be some indoor recreation opportunities. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's getting to that time of the year now where maybe it's a little cold to go for a walk after work or it might be dark after work. So we asked about uh, improvements for parks and open spaces, the top th three or four, public access to water bodies, the amenities, signage, bathroom, drinking fountains, and lighting and security were the things that rose to the top. <coughs> we asked people about how they value uh, the user fees. And you can see that the majority of people thought it was just about right. It averaged 2.9 on a scale of one to five, with three right in the middle. So. People did not appear to be upset with the user fees overall. 
legal question. Does the, the user fees, is that primarily um, a concert uh, revenue? I think that that would also include um, the pool facility. Uh, so any other recreational activities or programming as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Got away with it this time. Yes. Mister. So then again, we asked about what new, we asked a moment ago about programs and activities. Now we're asking about facilities, amenities, and equipment. Graphic picture, the top things were more uh, facilities or amenities for walking and jogging, splash pads, things that allow winter use, passive recreation, so that's the sitting at benches and tables and just enjoying nature, and more community spaces. We asked about uh, what should be the future implementation priorities. What are the things the town should look to do in the future? Preserve natural areas and develop and preserve existing facilities. Those were the top two responses. We asked about what type of activities people would like to do in the open space. Hiking, biking, and nature observation were the top three, which seems like the right things to be doing in those spaces. <laughs> you guys do the right thing. OK. Everybody's still with us. No one's glazed over yet? OK, great. So now we get to move on to the actual field inventory. Now, you all are very blessed with a large quantity of parks and many, many, many acres of open space. So I was able to go out in person and do a field survey of a lot of your area, not all of it, unfortunately. Believe me, I would have loved to have spent my summer on horseback doing nothing but riding the trails and the open spaces, but that is not my entire job yet, maybe someday. So I did field inventories of all of the parks. You can see them all listed here. I don't need to list them separately or vocally, but just be assured that you've got that covered. So I broke these into parks with active recreational opportunities and parks with passive recreation emphasis, I could say, because there's so much to offer and I wanted to be able to find a way to condense it and share it with you all. So I felt that in the active recreation area, sometimes you're going to see an overlap where I thought you. I do go out and uh, do surveys of parks all the time. It's, it's a large part of what I do in my career. And so you'll see things that look like, okay, it's over here with your strengths, but it's also over here in areas of improvement. And that's because I'm comparing what I'm seeing to what I've seen in other communities. So there might be situations, maintenance of facilities is an excellent example, where there are certain parks that are not necessarily as well maintained as other parks due to resources or use or whatever it may be. But compared to what I have seen um, traveling around all over the, the Northeast, uh, it's pretty darn good. So that's why you might see a little bit of overlap. Um, the other thing I found is that there are facilities for a wide variety of ages. I think that this certainly could be improved. But a lot of times we go into communities and there's really nothing but uh, active recreational opportunities which are geared more toward kids and teenagers and maybe young adults. And so you have a lot more opportunities for passive recreation and hiking and swimming and things like that which can be fairly unique in a community. Um, the distribution of your parks are a real strength. You have parks all over the place and they're pretty darn easy to get to. You can get there most of the time within 10 minutes via car. You can get on your bike a lot of times and bike to the park. Um, that's something else that we find very, very rarely. If you've seen me present at any of the other um, meetings that we've had, I have emphasized repeatedly that typically when we go into a community, they are really hurting for open space. And usually the demand for open space is just at the top of the list 
overall, that's all that anybody cares about anymore. But unfortunately, in a lot of these communities, they don't have any left. And so you're in a very unique position that you do have a great deal of open space. And at this point, you can continue to protect it so that you don't end up in sort of a crisis like a lot of the communities that we see are in. Um, so I commend you for that. Uh, the parks and open spaces are heavily utilized. I always saw people there. I always met people on the trails and at the parks. Um, you have a lot of passive and active recreational opportunities at all of the parks. You know, you could typically go there and in some cases, Simsbury Meadows is a great example, or Simsbury Farms, actually both, where you can go and get on some trails if you just want to walk around, or you can actually go there and play a sport. <coughs> The scenic qualities of the community are just beautiful across the board, and the facilities that you do have that have been recently upgraded are in excellent condition. <coughs> uh, areas of improvement across the board, I did hear feedback and saw in some cases that some of the fields were struggling with uh, irrigation and drainage. So there's a lot of spaces that have been built on formal formal uh, former wetlands or just wet areas back before people knew to get permits for that kind of thing or knew that they shouldn't do that kind of thing. Um, the other issue that I saw is some of the playgrounds are very outdated. Um, some of the parking lots are gravel parking lots and maybe they're meeting the needs for now but not necessarily for anticipated demands. Lighting was something that came up over and over again in the survey. It was something that I noticed too. Um, I was here in the summertime, so I really wasn't out that late. Um, but certainly as it starts to get darker, I noticed that there wasn't a lot of lighting in the parks. Um, and accessibility, you know, as Tom was saying, there are people in the community that have disabilities. <coughs> and um, I did find that there are a lot of situations where it would be difficult for people that are either in a wheelchair or have um, modal difficulties to get around the park. So some facility upgrades as well. The skate park definitely could use a little bit of love. There are some batting cages that have seen better days. And everybody's favorite, bathrooms. Either they don't exist or they're simply a porta potty and not everybody wants to use a porta potty. Moving on to passive recreation. Um, some of this is a little bit of overlap. Again, the distribution of spaces for passive recreation is quite good. So in a lot of cases, there are bicycle networks that will at least get you fairly close to the park. The maintenance of facilities is quite good. There's a lot of care to uh, turf maintenance, trying to keep the weeds and the trees out of the bicycle paths. You know, I know that's very appreciated by the community. It's very, it's all, overall, Simsbury is a very beautiful place. It's no wonder that people want to move here. Um, and there are quite a few pavilions and covered gathering spaces that people can go to to just sort of sit down and relax and enjoy the space. Um, areas of improvement are very similar to those with active recreation. That's partially because, you know, there's overlap in these spaces, that there's passive and active recreation at each park. But a lot of times spaces that are more designed for passive recreation just don't have um, sidewalks or pathways in them that go anywhere. Maybe they get a little bit around the park and then they just sort of die off. Um, lighting is always a concern. You don't want to necessarily light everything, but certainly those facilities that are heavily used, you probably do. Waste disposal, I found, um, could be problematic. It depended on the park. You know, some of the more heavily utilized and sort of eyes on the park type of spaces were very clean, but there were parks that I went to that people weren't visiting as frequently, and those parks were really being utilized and just people were just dumping their trash. There was one in particular, I think this is Terrafield Park, where there's problems with dumping. Um, so that's definitely an issue. The grills are out of date. That's really not abnormal for parks and open spaces. Um, nothing really unusual. So Simsbury open space, um, I, I had a chance to get out um, with members of the community and tour some of these amazing open spaces. I did a collection of very large open spaces and also took a look at some of the smaller, more fragmented open spaces that you have around the town. So sort of a list here, I went out to Simsbury Farms, 
toured the local trails, the same thing with Simsbury Meadows, I went on those trails, Onion Mountain Park, um, I had an opportunity to go running on some of your, your more heavily utilized pathways, so I had a chance to experience those. The sycamore tree area was absolutely wonderful. Um, in fact, when we came to, to interview for this project, the, um, the guy in our Connecticut office, the principal in our Connecticut office, was so excited to show us the sycamore, so that was the first thing we got to see in Simsbury before we even got the contract. So um, that's very exciting. Belden Forest, which just, which just got the um, old growth forest status, very, very cool space. What I thought was really interesting about Belden Forest was the prevalence of birds, um, which I didn't necessarily expect for a forest that was so close to commercial and residential areas, but there were a lot of birds in there, which was really cool. And then some of these smaller parcels, I thought this was very interesting. This isn't something I've really seen before, but when you've had development um, in the past in Simsbury, some open space has been designated as a part of that development. And within those smaller open spaces, there are typically neighborhood trails and some maintain landscape settings. So that's, that's unique to your community, certainly, at least from what I've seen. So, Going through the open spaces, um, you've got some incredible trail networks. Um, the maintenance of trails, by and large, is pretty darn good. I didn't feel unsafe on the trails. I didn't feel like I was going to slide down the hill, which is great. Um, they're close. You know, everything's within 10-minute driving distance. You can bike to some of these open spaces. I saw some really actually pretty good succession happening where storms have come in and knocked trees down and you're getting some good undergrowth happening. Um, and then in some of the forested areas, you've got quite a lot of diversity of uh, flora and fauna and they haven't yet been overtaken with invasive species, which there are definitely urban spaces that I see that where it's about 90% at this point. So you've got a good opportunity there to try to maintain that and not let it go um, that direction. Um, areas of improvement, certainly accessibility. I saw a lot of great trails, but there weren't a lot of trails that were necessarily designed for those who might have modal uh, difficulties. So I, I do think that it would be great to go in and do an analysis of those trails and design some of them so that people of all different abilities can get into the open spaces at least somewhat. Um, wayfinding on the trails, that's a major challenge here in Simsbury. Um, I'm fortunate that I feel like I have a fairly good sense of direction, but I think at nearly all of the open spaces I visited, I got turned around at one point or another and didn't, couldn't find any markers or the intersections weren't marked. Um, so that's certainly something that can be improved upon. Um, trails, a lot of times trails are developed over time sort of impromptu where people come in and just build the trails themselves. Maybe it's a historic thing, they're old logging roads, and sometimes those trails just aren't necessarily where we would place them today. So you see trails going through wet areas, you see trails that have degraded over time and there have been these sort of patches to try to fix it, um, but they might not be in the best location. Um, invasive species at some places are really a major concern and right now this slide is just particularly talking about the larger open spaces um, and typically what I saw are invasive species proliferation at the fringes so that means in the parking areas and also along the roadways and that's very typical that's where sites are getting disturbed continuously people are bringing in seeds on their shoes um, so it's just something to watch out for and to try to get under control before it takes over a larger space. So the smaller parcels, uh, there's a lot to be said for having smaller neighborhood trails. And uh, the, the major thing about it is that people can sort of walk out of their houses and immediately get into a natural setting. And they've got a trail right outside of their back door. And it's nice for people to be able to kind of get into the woods or get into a little meadow area and have that within walking distance. That's really 
wonderful. So it, it provides ease of you know short-term exercise. Most of these trails aren't very long, um, but at least you can get out and do a small walk. So that's great. Um, the town is doing a great job of maintaining these facilities. The asphalt on the trails, by and large, is in great condition. And they're working hard to keep back um, some of the weeds from infringing on the trails and to mow the sides of those trails. Um, areas of improvement, it's a lot of space for the town to maintain. It is a lot of resources dedicated to trails that most people don't know about unless you live in those neighborhoods. Um, something that's a little bit problematic with that is if those trails don't connect to a larger path system, it's time to sort of ask yourself who is really benefiting from those trails and um, is there something that we could do to improve the situation to provide better connectivity or potentially, how could communities get involved and take more ownership of some of these spaces? Um, the other issue with having trails in a more residential setting like this is the constant maintenance means that there's uh, an infringement and constant disturbance of the areas next to the trails. So these smaller open spaces are absolutely overrun with invasive species. You know, they're constantly getting weed whacked and mowed and people are out there, they're spreading their landscape plants into these natural areas. Um, and that's not something that's likely to change because a lot of those invasive species are coming from uh, people's homes and gardens. Um, waste disposal is another issue. There aren't trash cans along the trail, so sometimes I saw some trash where people are just sort of walking and throwing things down. Um, and then ADA access, you know, there are trails. The town is trying to maintain them. They might not always be accessible, and there might not always be the resources available to maintain every linear foot of trail, and so it could be t be potentially become a problem over time. We're done, sort of. ADA access. What is ADA? ADA, I'm sorry that I didn't define that earlier. That's Americans with Disabilities Act. Okay? So that just means we have a whole set of design criteria for how to provide access to people who might be in a wheelchair or might have crutches. Um, who might be you know, missing limbs, a variety of conditions, sight, hearing loss, um, how to design those facilities so that those people can still access those sites. Okay? So this is just an overall schedule. We are at our findings presentation. It's practically November. Um, and in December, we're planning to come back, do our draft presentation, and in January, we'll do the final presentation. We discussed that a little bit at the beginning, but I just wanted to remind you of the phase of the process that we are in at the moment. Okay. Do you want us to use the microphone? Okay. okay. So we're gonna take questions, and if you raise your hand, I will walk over near you. I'm gonna hold the mic, because we've had them hijacked in the past, and then we never get to the second person. <laughs> so uh, basically, I'm gonna allow you to speak and if we think you're getting off topic or taking too much time we'd like you to speak for like a minute minute and a half the elevator speech type thing if you ask a specific question we can go back into the presentation uh, but if you start off on a tangent that isn't related to what we're talking about or go too long I don't mean to be rude but I'm gonna move on to the next person so everyone has a chance Okay. we're gonna go right here you have a question there was a question earlier about the scope of this particular plan. Can you just identify for the audience exactly what was included in the scope and what wasn't? Sure. So the scope was quite broad. Um, however, we were tasked with doing sort of an overall inventory of the open spaces and parks. So we weren't tasked with necessarily specific parks or open spaces. We needed to be able to spread ourselves well enough around so that we were able to get a broad sort of bird's eye view of Simsbury um, and not get lost in the details of each individual park. Um, in terms of parks that were included versus not included, I, I believe the golf course was not included because of the private public partnership at the park. Um, and we were tasked strictly with those spaces that were maintained 
by the town exclusively and that are funded by the town. So any open space that was private, we were not gonna go in there and take a look at it. Any state park, we are not gonna go in there and look at it. We'll look at it sort of like overall to see how they connect to other systems, but we had to focus on what was funded by the town. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. <laughs> um, I came in a late, so I apologize. Um, sure. Interested in tennis courts, and I saw you had one slide where it didn't seem like it was in the top, um, but then there was off to the right, it was one of the things you highlighted. What was the response for tennis courts? And I'm specifically concerned with the Weetog side of town where there's not as much or tennis or basketball, really. Okay. Um, I, I can speak at this mic, I'm realizing, so you don't have to come back and forth. But so tennis courts did not make it into our top tier list. And Tom explained this, but you might not have been here. So these the charts were so long and so extensive that we had to just clip out parts of the survey. So what you were seeing there doesn't necessarily represent that the tennis courts were in the top tier. It's just what ended up happening to be part of the survey. Everything was listed, I think, in alphabetical order, and so it wasn't sorted by most popular, things like that. Um, now, we can certainly go back and take a look at the prevalence of answers about tennis courts in the Weetog area. Um, it, I can just take a note of that, and we can get back to you with that information. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I can speak loud enough. I don't know. They, they, they need you on the but television. Then, but then we, but then we can't take the that. mic away from no. you. <laughs> uh, so a question, potential comment question, I promise it's germane. Um, the initial uh, survey information, the background survey information, what was, where is the sample? I know you, it's ESTE, is the organization you Esri. Esri, and where yeah. is that sample from? Tom. So Esri is the company we use to do the demographic study, and the town gave us the boundaries that we were to work with, and that's where we pulled the information for the demographics. The trends were a combination. Yeah. The trends, we do two things. We do a local trends, and then we also do national and regional trends. The second question, though, is Jermaine. Just want to clarify, uh, uh, trash, or uh, uh, mm -hmm. what, was your, what was the term you used in there? Waste disposal. Waste disposal. Is that dumping or is that the need or lack of trash receptacles? Please correct It was the need or lack of trash okay. receptacles. Thank I you. did explore dumping a little bit because of that Terraville Park example, but the survey particularly was about uh, trash receptacles. Do you, do you come up with the remedies for these problems at the end? Yes, we absolutely do. And the next presentation in December will be a discussion of our preliminary recommendations. Be right back there. Remember? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I don't own a dog, but I was quite interested with the amount of people that walk dogs. What percent walk dogs? That, that seemed rather uh, interest me on this slide. Um, we can go back to the slide, certainly. 37%. Was it 37%? Wow. Thanks. <laughs> Great memory. I think what we gathered, people walk their dogs near their homes and also in the parks and open spaces. So. I would also imagine that they use the dog park. Yeah. Certainly the open spaces. Some of them. I'm just going to remark about your reference to the fact that the presentation only covers uh, a portion of the results of the survey. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you have announced where people can have access to the full, let's say, information that uh, answer to, uh, to your survey. Yeah, that will absolutely be available in the report. It, it, will, it will be available in the final report. Uh, that'll be January. Yep. Mm -hmm. Our experience shows there's many, many different parts of these studies that we do. And like uh, Rochelle did the level of service analysis of all the mm -hmm. parks. And if we sent that to you to just read, everybody has lots of questions that can be answered in all the other parts. So when we come back 
and we talk about everything we learned and what the recommendations are and why that helps put it all into perspective. Our job is to read through all of those things. So like there were written comments in the survey, we read every one of them. And we looked at every data in all kinds of different ways. We started off with 70 slides and we knew that oh, if we boy. had yeah. 70 slides we that can't, we can't we'd be at about number anybody. 35 right now yeah. and you'd be all passed there's out. A, there's an overwhelming amount of, of information, but we, we process all of it. It's just, it takes time to, to get through all of the comments. She's next, okay. Thank you. In the last group of slides, you were talking about small spaces, and I was wondering if you could give me an example of what one of those are, because it, it didn't really pop into my mind that this is what they were talking about. Absolutely. Not large parcels, the small ones. Yep, no, I understand. Um, so if you look off to the right here, uh, it's not entirely clear, but typically there are places like at intersections of roads in residential neighborhoods where there is a portion of town-owned open space that is maintained by the town. And from what I understand, and please jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but those open spaces were granted due to the development. So a developer goes in, builds a subdivision, say, right? And then that developer is required to set aside 2% of the total land area for open space use. And so those small parcels might be anywhere from two acres maybe. It depends. It really depends on the size of it. It could also include some smaller parcels that have been granted to the town over time by people who just wanted to preserve their parcel um, for open space into perpetuity. There are, uh, there's a couple of just open fields that are in the intersections of roads. There's one at Clifton Drive that's behind a residential neighborhood that's just basically, a, I think it's eight acres of open field. Um, and again, you know, that's that space that the town is maintaining. Does that make sense? It does? Okay, good. You guys have been doing this kind of a survey with different towns, because that's correct? Yes. And what, uh, you said well, only about 50% of the people that took the survey finished it. Is that normal for you guys to receive those results? I don't know that it's normal. Tom, do you want to speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, more it depends on how the survey is done. And we did a very large survey here, and we did it with SurveyMonkey. And um, it typically SurveyMonkey surveys, that's about what happens. Um, we the have some ones. surveys that um, a greater percentage of people take. Typically, when people don't finish the survey, it doesn't mean that they start and get tired and stop. It means they start, realize it's going to take some time, and they move around and answer the questions they want. If you could go back to that slide that tells the number of people that participated in the survey. So, yep. Oops, oops. Ah, okay. Yes. Yeah, the, High participation rate. That's, uh, a, that's a very good number, especially because this was an, what we would call an open link survey. Anyone in the community could take it. It wasn't in, you know, mailed to 3,500 homes and then yeah. it came in your mailbox and you took it. So what this is telling us, there were over 1,000 people in the town of Simsbury that took the time to go online and tell us what they thought. Which is really saying something with the prevalence right. of online surveys these days. Everybody's pretty burned out at this point, yeah. unfortunately. And 500 and almost 560 people completed the entire survey. Because of what we do, I travel a lot, so does Rochelle. I've taken over 130 flights this year, and I guess I've stayed in a hotel 260 times or something. Uh, but I get surveys all the time, and I know how important they are. So I do my best to take the survey from all those people because I'm giving them the feedback. And I try to go out of my way to not only hit 555 to put in a comment that was great customer service or you know it took me an hour and a half to check in whatever it might be so your community spoke yeah i 
I didn't see any questions having to do with biodiversity. Was that not something that was that was was that something specifically out of scope? Because when you're doing passive, being able to see birds, as you pointed out, are important, and um, and some of the open areas that we have might be managed better for biodiversity. But it was not part of the questionnaire at all to be able to respond that way. Um, I'm not exactly sure how that got teased out, but we are, do be confident that we are independently looking at the variety of techniques, management techniques that are currently utilized and how you could best uh, improve those to foster biodiversity. So my background, um, in addition to landscape architecture, my, my life before that was in habitat restoration. I have a lot of really great contacts with conservation organizations, so we have some great resources that we're going to use to plug into the report to uh, make recommendations to improve some of those practices. Yep. I noticed on the survey that uh, both the plus and the minus, we have a lot of open space. The complication with that is the maintenance of it. And I remember on the survey, I seem to remember, that it asked about volunteers. And is that uh, something that we could again do because when I first moved to town over 50 years ago, most of the open space was maintained by volunteers. So is that something that is uh, in the survey that has a percentage added to it? Um, it is not something that will be released as a survey moving forward, however, um, it's a big part of our planning process because we understand that it's just not possible with the resources that the town currently has or even that they might be projected to have to be able to maintain all of those open spaces. And so we have a whole section of the report actually, which is strategies for trying to obtain uh, more community engagement and the various resources in the region that might be able to assist with uh, the maintenance of some of those spaces. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, th I think there are uh, four state parks in or bordering Simsbury. Mm -hmm. um, how do they, are they going to interact with this process? I mean, yep. you, one lady talked about birding. Mm -hmm. I think um, Great Pond is an excellent spot for that, so I'm not sure I'd recommend Simsbury develop a, a birding habitat when, with that right there. Right. No, and I do understand that. So we are looking at a variety of mapping. We're going to be obtaining, I think it's from, I can't remember the acronym for it, but a national di di diversity database mapping to try to understand where some of those hot spots are, some diversity hot spots are. And then, you know, we don't really have control over the zoning of Simsbury. That's not part of our project at all. What we can do is provide mapping to show that there are potential corridors for wildlife and birds and amphibians, everything else that should be protected. No? I, I think also. I think oh, I'm sorry. I, th I do think we also look at other service providers. Oh, okay. So you know, we look at what the community asks for, and what the community can provide, and and what the community maybe shouldn't provide based on what's right nearby. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't understand that question, but. Um but Tom basically answered it, but yes, we'll, we're not only will we look at the types of services that they provide, but we look at some of their current management plans and then do a comparison of how their management compares to what Simsbury is doing, just to try to understand better. Um, is camping active or passive recreation? I think that would be passive recreation. Yeah. That wasn't anywhere. It might have. It might have been on this, yeah, you don't have it currently. Um, it, I think it was included as a potential option for open spaces. It might just not have floated to the top as one of the most important items for people. That doesn't mean it wasn't there. 
Uh, just a um, uh, informational issue. I assume that you uh, were able to access while you were trying to learn about the community and the open space, uh, especially. Um, you had access to the inventory that was prepared by the open space committee. Yeah. And I I think this is an opportunity through your services to help the citizens of the community know about that resource because it could ask answer a lot of the little questions that might have been asked this evening. Yeah. That it is an excellent resource for information. And we do typically provide in the plan itself, we'll either have, you know, a bibliography of all the resources that we utilize to prepare the plan. We received a huge amount of background materials from the town that we reviewed early in the process. Um, we can also just do recommended resources as part of the plan. Recommendation uh, aspect of your study that I, that could be better understood by the citizens of this town. How you're making your recommendations and what you're talking about that inventory would be very helpful. Okay, for them to access to know of it that and to know great. where they can see it. It's on the town site. Yeah, it's a good suggestion. Thank you. Good point, Mom. Um, <laughs> ah. it's, it's, okay. Qu quick question, uh, clarification, and the, the respondent asks. Uh, one of the points was in you, you dwelled on it for a second indoor uh, opportunities mm -hmm. uh, clarity clarity is that would in your mind would that be just a general one room purpose or general purpose one room or are we talking about a multidisciplined large broad community center with lots of different activities in it we're typically suggesting a community center because People, if I remember correctly on the survey, people had an opportunity to list like what it was that they would want from a space like that. And there's a variety of specific activities that people are looking for. Right. I'm sorry, but say when you see that <coughs> the multiple surveys in towns that are as close to us, yeah. is that the same respondents who from those? We, we see quite a lot of that. Okay. Yeah, we do. Okay. And, um, or if they have a community center, very often it's very, very outdated and people are looking for a better facility. We see that all the time, yeah. Yeah, every community is different and I've worked in lots of communities and I've been in communities your size that have two parks and that's you know all they have and I'm in other communities they have different things. You have a lot of outdoor parks. I think you use some school district facilities. You don't have a lot of indoor. I think over time people have desired to build the outdoor and now maybe it is something to look at. Maybe one of the recommendations and we're preliminary before we get there is that you actually do a feasibility study to consider that where you, you know, kind of figure out what would be the aspects of it, what it might cost to build and operate. That might be a recommendation that comes out of this. But financial impact to small businesses who have their own. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, we do typically look at that. Somewhat overlapping with what we're talking about, um, my question is, did the scope of this survey include programming offered by Parks and Rec? So not just the facility, I want more tennis courts, but can't offer such and such. Yes, it definitely did. And um, if I could find the side, I might be able to. Facilities and or activities pursued I believe that this was the slide, but what we ended up doing is combining the facilities and programming because they were very, very similar. Um, and I thought it was actually pretty surprising that people were as um, interested in passive recreation, just walking and jogging and sort of unstructured activities versus structured activities. That, but that was really, that was like the common theme that we saw. Um, but we do have them broken out, and there will be more detail in that final report for the various types of programming. And, and we also had the town provide us with a spreadsheet of all the programs they offer and the number of people that participate and if there's a waiting list and all of that. So that's being analyzed. I've been in the business a long time, and facilities and programs kind of go hand in hand. It's somewhat difficult to have programming if you don't have facilities or spaces. Mm -hmm. So typically, we would find in a community like this that you might not have a lot of indoor uh, 
activities or programs because you don't have a lot of those spaces. So a lot of your programs uh, really are more with the outdoor. But we've heard a desire. So I, I you just know. want to point out that golf is on there, just for the, the man who was very upset about golf. It is. It does exist. This gentleman. I'll be over there in a second. So just from a statistical consistency perspective, is the plan to do the same survey or more or less the same survey again in, the, in subsequent years? And how does this survey information compare to what existed from the town beforehand? You know, I don't have an answer to that because I believe the last master plan was done a pretty darn long, long time ago. But that's certainly a worthwhile uh, thing to look at. And we do have that master plan, so we'll take a look and just sort of try to extract what the differences and similarities are. And then I don't think that future surveys would be identical to this because national demographics change over time your town is going to change over time like the the composition of the people that live here you don't think so it's going to stay the same and be perfect forever no it's not <laughs> um it depends on you call change half a percent alteration one way or the other every year is about as dynamic as it gets okay okay but um go ahead yeah, i was just going to say you know every community looks at their master plan differently a lot of communities update them every five years, every 10 years, every 15 years. It just depends. Um, so there'll be a recommendation most likely that you come back and review where you're at and update it. Like typically, had a master plan been done in the last five or 10 years, one of the things we would have done is looked at all the recommendations that were recommended yeah. then and, and where are you at today. Yeah. But it was done so long ago, I, I think that we reviewed it, but it wasn't very relevant at this point. <laughs> so I know I came in late, my apologies for that, but when you did the survey, is there any data out there around demographics and like we talked about the changing of our town and maybe some of the needs of the town? So like, I mean, needs of the services, like you have biking and playgrounds, so if we did it by age group, you know, are there things that seniors were looking for that maybe we don't have? The demographics, don't ask that question because that's about what your community actually is. The survey asks questions. We would have to go back and try to look at the survey questions and match them up with the So we'll have to see if we can sort that through SurveyMonkey. We might be able to sort that. The other thing that we will have a closer look at is all of the comments, because there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments. And we'll be able to glean some information from the comments as well, yeah. I kind of got a vague sort of question. I don't know. With playgrounds, it, it says it's one of the things that we'd like here, and you mentioned it's one of the updated things that need updating too. Yeah. Uh, in your past surveys or anything, this is kind of an idea I had. Is there anything with uh, playgrounds about in like a natural setting kind of a playground that happens like in the woods and you use kind of like a ropes course type thing or or like a treehouse kind of thing? Yeah. Um, or written as a playground. I mean, absolutely. That's certainly come up as an. Oh yeah. Yeah. They have like natural snowboard parks. Yeah. And I didn't know if there could be natural playgrounds. Certainly, there's the wild center. Right. Absolutely. There's a wild center up in the Adirondacks. Tom, you're out west a lot. Do you see that out yeah, west? Yeah. One of the big things that's happening now is all the adventure activities, and so that's in our trends report recommendations for things like that. Uh, we're actually looking at some facilities that are being built indoors that instead of having a track that just goes around the biggest space, they're actually putting an adventure trail that goes throughout the building. It's kind of like bringing cross country indoors. Um, we're seeing zip lines, slack lines, uh, playgrounds for older teens and tweens. We're also seeing uh, in some communities where there's an outdoor gym. So instead of the old situation where there'd be a trail and you ran a quarter of a mile and you did an exercise, you ran another quarter of a mile, some communities are taking 10 or 12 pieces of equipment and putting it in one spot in the park. And people go there to work out and to socialize. 
Yeah. Same and, thing for um, adult playgrounds, which yep. are cropping up in different places, which I think are awesome. Yep. And by the way, <laughs> that's why I was asking the question about demographics because yeah. in a lot of communities, I've noticed that there are some areas in which they're creating areas for seniors to do exercise outside. So that's sure. why I was asking about that breakout. Yes, yeah. Well, we do need to take a look, closer look at that. I was taking a pickleball here. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing we're seeing, um, you know, is the popularity of mountain biking. So then constructing pump tracks that might be close to an outdoor space um, that the kids can kind of learn how to mountain bike and then having different grades of difficulty on the trails so the kids can kind of learn and progress as they go. There's a lot of just amazing recreation stuff, adventure stuff going on. Where were dog parks and all this? Did we hear much about that? Um, the dog park was pretty limited to Simsbury Farms or Simsbury Meadows. I was just asking my co colleague about dog parks because in a lot of communities we hear the need and interest for dog parks and in a lot of areas people have places to walk their dogs already but we typically find that a dog park isn't for the dog it's for the owner to go and socialize with other owners and they get to know the names of the dogs but they don't get to know the name of the people they're talking to uh, yeah do you have an inventory of private recreation facilities in town do we? I don't believe we have a full one. We'll work with the town to try to get that because that's something we'll look at. I know someone mentioned earlier if you were to do an indoor facility that it could affect local businesses. And typically when you get to thinking about that and you're doing a feasibility study, all of that is taken into account. And, and our research shows that if you involve those people in that actual process, their businesses typically flourish. Uh, there's many communities that a community center is built and several more gyms open up because people go to the town gym to get started, but then they want more and they go to the local provider. Mm -hmm. They want to advance their skill levels. Yeah, yep. it does happen. Other questions or comments? Well, thank you very, very much for coming. Thank you. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.